Yes. So I think I've just been given the green light to start. Um, I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. And uh, you're at Saudi Arabia's transformation uh, uh, to the, uh, in the changing global context. Uh, if you meant to be going to New York or Chicago, this is where you are. Uh, and please stay here because this is going to be a riveting uh, session with six amazing speakers, uh, three men, uh, three women, three women, three men. Uh, and uh, uh, we are in a context of 2022, 2023. We've had a triple cha challenge. Some people would call it a triple shock. Geopolitical, macroeconomic, and energy. Um, uh, Putin's war in Ukraine, global slowdown, inflation, and recession. And then, of course, energy market volatility. We all know about all of those things. Uh, the world had plenty of losers in 2022, including in the region of the Middle East. It also had winners. Uh, I think there's a consensus economically. Saudi Arabia was a true winner uh, in, uh, in the past year, buoyed by energy prices for sure, but also national investments and changes in planning and approach. We've got limited time, and we've got six incredible speakers. Uh, we have all agreed that we're going to try to get through two rounds of questions. The first will be more focused on Saudi Arabia. The second will be more Saudi Arabia's global position. Uh, and uh, and we're try we'll try to get through them as quickly as we can so we can get to your questions as well. And everyone has, uh, has agreed to be brief so that we can do that. Um, uh, the speakers, and I'm going to introduce them very quickly, and the order that they will be speaking and answering questions. Uh, Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director of the IMF. <coughs> Jane Fraser, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Citigroup. Oh, sorry, uh, let me go in the order we'll be going. So it's <laughs> Kristalina Georgieva first, and then His Excellency Mohammed al Jadan, Minister of Finance, Saudi Arabia. Uh, then Her Royal Highness Ambassador Rima bint Bandar al Saud, Ambassador of Saudi Arabia to the United States. Uh, a local with me in Washington, D.C. Uh, fourth will be His Excellency uh, Abdullah al Sabah, al Swa, uh, Minister of Communications Information Technology in Saudi Arabia. Fifth, then, will be Jane Fraser, the Chief Executive Officer of Citigroup. And then finally, His, Excell His Excellency Bandar al Khoraif, uh, the Minister of Industry and Mineral Resources in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so let's get right to it. Um, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director of the IMF. Um, in uh, October 2020, she won the Atlantic Council's, this is my only commercial moment, the Atlantic, <laughs> the, the Atlantic Council's highest honor, our Distinguished Leadership Award for her contributions to a better world. Uh, uh, she um, traveled uh, to Riyadh October 20, 2022, so very recently announced the establishment of an IMF regional office in Riyadh. And so I wonder, uh, I wonder, um, uh, Madam Managing Director, whether you can set the scene for this, uh, for this panel in two ways. First of all, uh, where is the global economy currently going, very briefly, and what's your assessment of this trajectory? But then, where does Saudi Arabia fit into this picture, since we're trying to start this first round, focus a little bit more on the Saudi picture? Well, great. Um, um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, when I visited uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, I was incredibly impressed by the uh, uh, progress that the country has made in implementing Vision 2030 and uh, becoming a uh, bright spot for the world economy and, of course, uh, in its own region. And that is happening in particularly difficult time for the world. Uh, we have experienced the unthinkable events, the pandemic, war in Ukraine, and uh, the consequences in terms of energy and food prices skyrocketing, creating cost of living crisis for hundreds of millions of people with inflation being high, central banks have no choice but to tighten interest rates, and that uh, throws uh, cold water on the prospects for growth. So if I'm to give you the uh, 
60 seconds version of our outlook. 2023 growth would continue to decelerate. We expect it to bottom out towards the end of the year. In other words, better times lie ahead. But we would continue to face very significant uncertainties because of the war, because of the fact that we don't quite yet know how China's reopening <coughs> will impact growth in China, and because of the continuous fight against inflation through tightening of interest rates, even if inflation seems to be finally moving in the right direction, there is a long way to go. So difficult 2023 with some hopes for swinging uh, uh, up in terms of growth prospects. In this context, uh, we look at the uh, high uh, uh, growth rates of Saudi Arabia with uh, gratitude for you, but also because we need that for the regional and the world economy. And let me just say uh, three things about uh, what uh, um, uh, Saudi Arabia is doing uh, right. One, uh, fiscal policy. I don't know many countries where during these difficult times there would be the courage to increase VIT from 6 to 15 percent. The Saudis uh, uh, did it and they are using uh, the increase of, uh, of revenues uh, very effectively uh, to create uh, investment environment for future growth, for diversifying the economy. Secondly, I am so proud uh, that we have uh, a panel hosted by, by, by the Saudi, Saudi leadership uh, that is 50-50. Uh, and that is a reflection of what is happening in the country. I met with a group of Saudi women. The, the uh, incredible excitement there was among them about their <laughs> opportunity to contribute uh, is, uh, is fantastic. Uh, the, the, the Saudis had a 30% target by, by 2030 of women <laughs> participating in the la labor force. How many know where they are today? Volunteers? 37%. Mm -hmm. Exceeding the target. Uh, so uh, that is a very important thing. But the third I want to say that would take us uh, later on to global role. Uh, Saudi Arabia takes its uh, good fortunes uh, uh, to heart to play an important role in energy security, in food security, and in addressing the incredible challenge of debt. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, praise um, uh, Minister Al Jadan uh, for taking the in initiative to create the common framework for debt resolution uh, and to invite him to, be, to continue to be a leading force as we aim to create a global roundtable on debt so a major problem for low-income countries can be addressed. Thank you. That's a great way to kick us off. And uh, the finance minister, as uh, Kristalina knows, is at the IMF and World Bank meetings is one of the rock stars who comes into town. And uh, uh, I hope that's an accepted thing to call someone in Saudi Arabia. But you really are highly respected. You, you really are so highly respected by all of your peers. I wonder, I wonder if you can pick up uh, where Kristalina left off, Mr. Minister. How do current global economic conditions affect the kingdom and its transformation? And maybe reflect uh, as well uh, your performance at the G20 and what that said about uh, uh, how, how Saudi Arabia steps into the global situation. Thank you very much and thank you everyone for making it. I'll try to be brief. I think there is only 36 minutes, so I need about 40. Uh, but a uh, few things really to say, really. Um, I mean, Vision 2030 was a breakthrough in the way Saudi think about the, the economy, the social the fabric, the fiscal even discipline. And it is a very wide reaching, so it includes, you know, economic diversification, fiscal you know, reforms and social reforms. And, and Kristalina touched on some of these. But what is really important about Vision 2030 when it comes to the global you know, uh, discussion is the long-term plans and the commitment actually to execute in that long-term plans and the long-term investments that are happening in Saudi. Uh, what that, that what really matters and that what made a difference in the way we even 
um, handled the international and global shocks that uh, we have seen over the last three years. COVID-19 hit the world and hit the world, including Saudi. Saudi was largely prepared. We invested heavily in technology before that. So when COVID hit, we were able to very quickly, trans, you know, seamlessly really move from actual to virtual in a lot of sectors, in government services, health services, education, etc. And there is something really to, to think about and, and learn from in terms of what needs to be done globally and how to be proactive and responsive. The second point is we saw inflation coming earlier than what a lot of people um, anticipated. And because of all the stimulus packages that the world have put into the world economy, by 20, by I think July 21, we saw the signs. And we said we need to do things that will protect the Saudi economy from inflation. And we have done that successfully. So we froze energy prices in the local economy. And what happened is inflation in the world was above 8% um, in 2022. In Saudi, we did not reach 3%. Uh, the latest number is 3.3. And mm -hmm. in average, it's about 2.6. The likelihood of next year is that inflation will not be as high. We are also looking at our region. And we want it to be a role model for the region. And we are encouraging a lot of the countries around us to really do reform. And we are changing the way we provide assistance and development assistance. According to the OECD, Saudi is ranking number one in the official development assistance when it comes to GNI. And we used to give direct uh, grants and deposits without strings attached. And we are changing that. We are working with multilateral institutions to actually say we need to see reforms. Yeah. We are taxing our people. We are expecting also others to do the same, to do their efforts. We want to help, but we want you to also to, to do your part. So in, in short, there is a lot of work that is being done to insulate Saudi economy, but also to help the global economy. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Minister. Uh, Princess Rima, first woman uh, as ambassador in Saudi history. Uh, you're on all prominent lists of uh, leading women, not just uh, in Saudi Arabia, but in the world. Uh, we met when I was visiting Riyadh and you were running the National Sports Authority. Uh, so uh, an, an unusual roles that you've played um, uh, in Saudi history. Uh, what are the social dimensions of the challenge that we've heard about from the two speakers that preceded you? The, uh, the, the, the social dimension of the challenge in Saudi Arabia, and then, and then how is the country, how is the kingdom addressing them? The first challenge that we faced when uh, we were asked to create this, global, uh, this national initiative, which was the National Transformation Program, was how do we look across the board and create the correct economic formula that has female inclusion in it as a baseline? And when we talk about inequality and we talk about inequity and sustainability, you can't possibly have a sustainable economy if 50% of your society isn't included. So whether we were looking at the work of the Ministry of Sports, Ministry of Education, Finance, every single ministry had that touch point. So the kingdom addressed inequity from the start of the design and inception of the vision. And that's something that's fundamental for people to understand. Women weren't an afterthought in the design of what we're doing. And in that process, we looked at where are we as a baseline as a nation and where do we need to go? And people ask, is what you're doing in the kingdom replicable? It is and it isn't. It is replicable because when you work with intent to create change, you're very clear on the goal you'd like to achieve. And we feel we've achieved it, to your point. 35% today is our 2030 goal. We've already achieved it. And we can tell you across the board, every single minister has hit their 2030 KPIs today. Mm -hmm. So we've done something right, and it was bold. If you look at the kingdom today, when I started at the Ministry of Sports, um, we had zero women in sports. We have over 300 in the pipeline. But those are 300 athletes. That's not counting the about 150,000 in the extended world of sports. When we look at culture, when we look at... Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we now have five female diplomats across 
the world, and one of them is representing us today to the European Union, positions that women now can aspire to. But you talk about also the social change of the mind, yeah. and that's what's critical. The social change of the mind is looking at a woman as an equal and as an opportunity for all. Today women have equal pay in the kingdom, today women have equal opportunities, that might not be true of many other countries in the world. So how can we as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia lead in this? We can lead by being a role model, not just for our region, but I would really honestly say for the extended Islamic world to have the promise there is in digital economy globally, but we also know the dangers of inequities and digital divides. So how do you see those in the Saudi context and how are you dealing with them? First of all, it's always a pleasure to connect with lifelong partners and friends. And this is a testimony, what we're seeing right now in the room, that once we partner, we partner for a lifetime. When it comes to the digital divides, uh, I think we all agree with the World Economic Forum. The fragmented world that we have today does indeed need a new system for collaboration and cooperation. But let's not forget that this fragmented world is so interconnected and interdependent. One virus in one pocket of the world could cripple down 75% of the global supply chains and one food security challenge, and we heard it today, could not only double the number of people without access to basic food, but actually wipe out the collective progress that we have made in the past 10 years. This is why the kingdom stands clear as your partner for choice for how we can bridge those global divides, how we can bridge those digital divides for a better tomorrow <coughs> and a brighter future. On closing down the digital divides, I remember during the toughest year that humanity has seen in the past 90 years, during the G20 2020, under the leadership of His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman, we drove consensus that we must connect the unconnected world. 2.7 billion people on the face of Earth don't have access to the internet, don't have access to education, remote education, remote work, and remote healthcare. This is completely not acceptable. We've commissioned a study during the G20 with the ITU and the World Economic Forum that it's gonna cost us around half a trillion dollars to connect the unconnected world if we use ground networks. And this is why we have launched the NTN program, the non-terrestrial network program in how we can connect the ground with the space, with Earth. And we have done the first trial last year in which you have a 5G tower connected to a plane flying at 20 kilometers above the Earth connected to a low Earth yeah. orbiting satellite. And this is going to connect the unconnected world for a fraction of the cost. Yeah. There's so much polarization in the analog world. During that year, we have launched the Digital Cooperation Organization. Like-minded nations came together, 11, and we launched this year with WEF, bridging the digital divides, a roadmap of how we bring those nations together. Last but not least, the Royal Highness touched base on it, and I have to share it in every Davos. This is one of the stories that we must hear in every Davos. Women, inclusion, and empowerment in tech. This is the most audacious and bold reform story in the 21st century. We jumped from 7% to 32%. Mind you, this is higher than the EU average, G20 average, and also the Silicon Valley average. 
And it's not a surprise, and her Royal Highness is a mentor to a lot of these women entrepreneurs. You have Sarwa al Hazza, who's tackling type 2 diabetes, the silent pandemic that is actually killing three times COVID 19, and they're tackling it with data and AI. These are live examples of how the kingdom is your partner for choice for bridging those global divides. Uh, Mr. Minner, thank you for that, Mr. Minister. And as you know, in Silicon Valley, that's been a perennial issue uh, of women's empowerment. So thank you for uh, raising how you're handling it. Uh, Jane Fraser, a chief executive officer at City, like Princess Rima, the first woman to be appointed uh, to her position. Uh, uh, spearheading efforts to reopen city operations in Saudi Arabia. So Jane, I wonder if you can tell us uh, in, a little bit the way that um, Kristalina did with the high level and then the Saudi level of how you see the global financial and business environment evolving in 2023. And then what FDI opportunities, foreign direct investment opportunities, you see particularly in Saudi, perhaps the Middle East more broadly? Yeah. So as, as Kristalina talked about, there's a lot of global dislocation going on in the world at the moment. Um, and so when one turns up in Saudi, um, looking at uh, you know, what, what are the opportunities from a business perspective, and you've seen Vision 2030, but then you arrive in the, in the post-COVID world and you see what's happening on the ground, it's quite breathtaking. Um, and to reinforce what we were talking about on the panel, our head of Saudi is a woman. Head of sales and trading for City in Saudi is a woman. Head of Middle East is a woman. Um, and uh, they predated me, so it's not just because I'm a woman running the firm. And we, I can see it live in terms of what we're talking about in the economic opportunity a societal opportunity, but also I think when we see what's happening in terms of energy transition, um, where Saudi is really leading the way. So as a banker, one gets frightfully excited when you turn up and see what's going on, because it is, it is a long-term vision at a point in the world where there is a real desire for long-term investment opportunities. Um, and for the investors that we work with, this is an exciting opportunity. For the multinationals that a bank like City works with, this is an exciting opportunity. <coughs> Uh, to come in and participate in the rapid growth and the rapid change that's occurring in the kingdom. Um, some of the areas that we see as particular opportunities, which is a little unusual, is the public sector leading the private sector. Um, there's a little bit of, a, everyone's back's a little bit of out of joint in the private <laughs> sector because the public sector is leading the way. It feels very dynamic. Um, the talent base there is extraordinary as well. So as we look at how do we deploy capital, where do we put it, I think the opportunities to start building out SMEs and, and the middle market companies is going to be another wave of opportunity within, uh, within Saudi that will be an important one. Um, and that will build out more of the ecosystem of different industries within the country as, uh, as Saudi diversifies away from oil, but not to um, diminish the important role of the transition that Aramco is so important in. Um, the investments that have made, been made in hydrogen uh, in uh, Saudi is another area that we talk about leapfrogging um, and leading the way. Um, this is very, very important for the world, not just for the country. So from my perspective, leading a global bank, um, what we see in a dislocated world and a more fragmented world is a country with a true vision. As a former consultant, I get very excited with visions, but then I get even more excited when I see the execution against them in reality, as we, we've been talking about. But then also the possibilities in the future of a Saudi really being an innovative beacon for the Middle East and um, elsewhere in the world and that will be very attractive for capital flows in and out of the country and also for entrepreneurs um, who want to come in and participate in this. Thank you so much for that Jane. Uh, Minister al Koraev, uh, and you are the owner of the relatively new ministry uh, dealing with industry, dealing with mining. Uh, uh, everyone in the world is talking about supply chains, fragmentation of supply chains. I think, again, it would be interesting to know how that plays out uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the Saudi concept uh, and what are you doing about it? 
Well, thank you very much. I wish I was the owner, but I, I'm actually helping execute. Uh, definitely, I mean, the two sectors, both industry and mining, have great potential in Saudi Arabia. With, with industry, we already have a great industrial base. The industrial strategy is all about taking this industrial base to the next level. So it is, it is uh, aiming to create an agile, competitive, and sustainable industrial economy. It is uh, uh, it's a mixture of great targets when it comes to GDP, export, investment, but most importantly, it's the mix that we are trying to do and create within the country. The added value, the added value products, the complexity that we are trying to bring within, within, within the sector to be also uh, a main exporter. The, the whole design of the sector is aimed to definitely to fulfill local demand and resilience, but, but also uh, export is key. Export is key in the traditional uh, sectors such as petrochemicals, but also the added value that we are creating in the uh, different uh, uh, wealth that we have both in, in petrochemical or, or now with minerals. So this is, this is a, a, a strategy that is uh, also creating the future opportunities for our generation and generation to come. We bet on technology, we bet on advanced manufacturing, and that's why we are investing heavily. I think the connectivity that uh, uh, my colleagues, ministers have talked about is enabling the sector also to benefit from, uh, from uh, that to, to, to create the future of industry. With regards to, to mining, I think that since it's a relatively new sector in Saudi Arabia, I think it shows how, you know, if, if, uh, if strategies are science, implementation is art. And we have been able to show the art of implementation in uh, a sector which is uh, uh, normally, it's, it's a very heavy sector to move, but we have been able to show that Saudi Arabia in a very small period of time has been able to, to be a, a vocal point in the global mining community. In fact, we launched our uh, Future Mineral Forum, which took place first edition last year, and la only last week we had the second edition. It showed great interest from the global community because we are not focusing on our market. We realize that mining is an industry that had uh, created uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, um, bad practices that we are working together as a global community to help and see how we can turn this industry into an added value to the regions in a social, from social impact, from environmental impact. So the whole essence of the forum is really to bring the different stakeholders from governments, mining companies, financial institutions, academia, in one platform in Riyadh, focusing on the sector, focusing also on how we can help the global community get the uh, minerals and, and metals needed for the future of, uh, of uh, the net zero targets, future of manufacturing, and so on. Mr. Minister, thank you for that. Um, uh, strategy, science, implementation, art. I like that. Um, so we're going to the second round. Uh, that was tight. The speakers were all uh, very brief um, and, and, and a lot of information packed into there. But believe it or not, for this second round, you're going to have to be even briefer if we're going to get it done because we're at half past and we only have 15 minutes. Uh, and so uh, probably, uh, but let's get right into it uh, because I think this is very, uh, a very useful conversation. So, uh, uh, Madam, Madam Director Grodieva, I wonder if you could uh, talk about, you talked about the issues facing the global economy. Now I wonder if you could talk about the highest global, global uh, collaboration priorities, mm -hmm. if you could get one or two. And then where would um, Saudi Arabia particularly have leadership there, whether it's energy security, food security, debt? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we um, have lived through um, great uh, three decades uh, when after the collapse of uh, the uh, former Soviet bloc, uh, we saw an integration of the global economy that gave an impetus to lifting up standards of living practically everywhere. 
uh, within these three decades, we quadrupled the world economy. Sorry, we tripled the world economy. We quadrupled emerging market developing economies, doubled advanced economies. Uh, but now the PC uh, dividend is gone uh, because uh, of Russia's invasion. And uh, we uh, recognize we live in a more shock prone world. What is the uh, impact? Number one, we see a reversal of the best achievement we have had, which is bringing poverty numbers down, bringing the number of people going to bed hungry down. These numbers are going up. And unless uh, we recognize uh, that uh, uh, this is not only uh, morally wrong, but it would undermine security for all of us and take action, I think we would be living in a worse world uh, than we have enjoyed in these last decades. What does it mean and where uh, Saudi Arabia fits? Number one, we need to increase the well-being of people by just growing the world economy. And we know that we grow it faster when it is an integrated economy, uh, when we trade with each other. We do have to recognize the necessity to improve the resilience of supply chains and that security of supply uh, matters, but not drive it to a point that makes us poorer. We have run a study. It says if we are careful how we adapt uh, uh, to this uh, security of supplies, it would cost us only 0.2% of global GDP. If we are not careful, if we uh, slip into protectionism on a massive scale, it would cost us 7% of global GDP, $7 trillion, not affordable. And I count on Saudi Arabia to continue to be a force of global integration. Secondly, I count on Saudi Arabia to lead in uh, the uh, adaptation to a changing climate, not only in the transition to clean energy, but in how we are going to feed the world's people when water is running short. How can we make agriculture more sustainable so we can succeed? And I know you're doing a lot of research on that. And finally, I want to stress the importance of generosity. Those who have more have a responsibility to help those who don't and do it in a prudent way. I uh, welcome your focus on reforms because giving money to countries that just squander them in bad programs makes no sense. But working together to lift up the performance of economies and they be generous to those who need that, this generosity, please continue to lead in that way. Thank, thank you so much for that uh, sharp comment. We continue the second round, the lightning round, Minister uh, al -Jadan. Um We haven't talked about China, <coughs> and that is another thing that's just happened in the news, the visit of President Xi Jinping in December, and uh, coming with him $50 billion of investments. Uh, what role, uh, this is a big shift in the geopolitical scene, what role does this relationship uh, now play for Saudi Arabia? Thank you very much, and I think this is actually an important question, but also I would take a wider approach. I think China is very important for Saudi. It is the largest trade partner of Saudi Arabia, but also the U.S. is a very important and strategic partner. We are looking to enhance our relationship with Europe. We are uh, actually advancing our relationship with Latin America, with Asia. So our aim is really to bridge the divide. Our aim is to be a force of communication, and we are encouraging communication, whether it is China, the U.S., or others. I can tell you in some of the initiatives that we have done through the G20, a lot of communication I have had with my colleagues in the U.S. and China to try and bridge certain of the differences of opinions to reach for the good of the world. A common framework is one, um, food security, we've been working with Indonesia to try and find solutions to the global food security, energy security, we are playing a very important part, whether it is in conventional energy or in renewable energy, including hydrogen and others. So we are really trying, and you are asking on, on, on Saudi Arabia to play their part, we are playing our part, and you can count on Saudi Arabia to continue playing that part. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Princess Rima, uh, I'll go from uh, uh, China to the United States. 
Uh, I live in Washington. I see that it's not always easy to be the Saudi ambassador to the United States. Uh, uh, this has been a particularly challenging year where the Biden administration was none too happy with the uh, oil production cuts when they came. In a, in a, uh, maybe in a general sense, a broader sense, uh, how do you see the relationship evolving and where, do you, where are we now? Look, it, it goes without saying that whether it's the Saudi-U.S. relationship or Saudi relationship with any country, there's highs and lows. But the important thing is to recognize that we are strategic partners and we've been friends for over 80 years. And we've stood by each other where it counts and where it matters. And some of those moments are public and some of those moments are private. But this relationship that's 80 years old will maintain another 80 and 80 and 80 after that because it's not just good for the United States of America, but it's also good for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And that partnership creates a more stable world. We've seen it in times of conflict. We've seen it in times of, of pandemic. We've seen it where we mobilized the G20 uh, on the COVID relief. We've seen it in debt relief across the board, everywhere that we engage counterterrorism. Anybody that thinks that the world of terror has ended is greatly mistaken. And the collaboration that the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have is why you don't see headlines. It's why you see peace and prosperity across the world. And it's why it's beyond critically necessary. Um, so yes, there was a moment of conflict and disagreement. But that doesn't take away from the fact that we are both strategic allies and we are friends, and this relationship is critical to the world. We talk about the World Economic Forum. One of the strongest economies in the world is the United States of America. One of the strongest economies in the Middle East is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And so it is to the global benefit that the two of us maintain the strength of this relationship. But we do it because we actually like each other, not just for, <laughs> for, for that reason. And while it may be tough uh, sometimes to be the Saudi ambassador in Washington, it's a job that I carry with profound pride not just because I'm the first woman to do this, but the legacy of this relationship. It's personal, it always has been. Our students have come to the US for tens of years. And the best of the best that's in today's Saudi government studied in the United States. So we have a debt to the US and as much as the US has a debt to us. Um, and that debt is the one that we don't hold each other accountable for because it's for the greater good. So uh, I could do an hour and a half panel on this subject, <laughs> but I am not allowed to. So I'm going to move on uh, just, to, just to ensure that we, uh, we stay on time. So Minister Al-Sawa, uh, what can be done collectively? So we talked about the Saudi digital divide issues. Uh, what can be done collectively uh, and globally to ensure inclusion in the digital future? And can Saudi Arabia uh, uh, scale what it's doing? Can it contribute to the digital picture globally. I love what you said earlier, that the kingdom should be a global force for integration. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree more. And when it comes to scaling digital solutions for the wider region, I mean, the report that was released by the Digital Cooperation Organization chaired by the kingdom recently laid out the roadmap with what we call the three C's, common frameworks, collective action and collaborative tools. And let me share with you a personal story. You, you touched base on the entrepreneurship story. So about 12 years ago, I was lucky and fortunate. As I was a recipient of Prince Mohammed bin Salman Misk Foundation support for entrepreneurs. And as a result of that, I was part of a group of entrepreneurs that we launched the first health tech and telemedicine solution for the world mm -hmm. that today is powering more than 50 million virtual consultations mm -hmm. within the region saving thousands of lives. And what I love is that our Minister of Health and the healthcare champions that we have, have taken it to the next level. They have launched the Saudi Virtual Hospital and taking it to a next level. I'll give you one example of how much impact they are doing for the region. One of the critical things within the healthcare professional is called door to needle. For stroke patients, you need to operate and prepare the room between 25 minutes to 60 minutes to be able to prevent partial and full you know, paralysis. And they were able to deliver that capability for the region. Once again, these are live examples of how the kingdom is a force for global integration. Door to needle, thank you so much. Really interesting. Uh, Jane Fraser, um, again, we've, we're going from the Saudi specific to the more global. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the, uh, and we talked about the risks of recession, risks of global instability. What are the highest priority pathways globally to addressing that this year? Yeah, the, um, 
I think very much around uh, our view of what's going to be happening in the world is different countries are in very different positions at the moment. And so we're expecting to see a rolling series of country recessions around the world. Um, at the moment, we've seen the tail risks coming in a little bit more. It's been, although yesterday was not a case in point, a warmer winter um, in Europe. Uh, we've obviously seen some very uh, good news from an economic opening and a slightly more bent to market um, friendly measures in China um, as they open up, albeit with a short term um, cost on the, the uh, human health component. But China also opening up is important for the world. And in the States, a very strong labor market and what's likely to be a recession there, but uh, something that uh, is pretty manageable. So it's quite a choppy time um, in the world. High level of interest rates with central bank tightening likely to continue. Um, so when you look at where Saudi can play a role, it's not just as we've talked about, which is a sort of role model that makes everyone in the Middle East up their game. Um, and not only from the societal and other changes, but its ability to focus on some of the longer term <coughs> impacts in the world. So what is happening in Africa? Um, an area I know I've spent a lot of time talking with our friends and colleagues in Saudi about the food security issues that Kristalina was talking about. How do we build out transmission networks in Africa? What are other areas that Saudi can play an important role? Similarly, conversations in India, one hears a lot of discussion about them, um, Saudi Arabia as well, China, all around the world. And as we've all talked about, uh, an important friend um, of the United States and a partner. So I think for in, in this dislocated and challenging world, that leadership role that Saudi can play, given its economic strength um, and the dynamics going behind it, can play an important role on some of the uh, providing solutions to longer term issues, whilst others are a little bit more focused on tactical or uh, pressing immediate issues. Uh, thank you so much, Jane. I see our clock ticking down a little bit. This may be the last question I'm going to look for a sign from the organizers. Uh, but Minister Korayev, I wonder if you could talk um, uh, about how you're going to achieve the huge ambitions of industrial strategy. So the goal is to triple the country's industrial domestic product, double the value of industrial uh, exports. I love stretch goals, but are these achievable? Thank you. I was hoping for the same question they had, but anyway, I will take shot. <laughs> uh, definitely, as I said earlier, I mean, today, uh, the opportunities that we see in both uh, industry and mining are uh, just uh, enormous, and uh, the ambitions of the country is beyond local market. If we look at our petrochemical industry, we today uh, represent almost 6% plus of the uh, global market in petrochemical, where 85% of our petrochemicals export is exported. If we just do the math and see how much we can convert from that amount to be added value within the country, we will see how significant we can create in terms of growth just with the downstream chemicals. Now, if we look at the other 12 sectors that we have chosen, they were chosen carefully because we either have a competitive advantage that allows us to grow very fast or they create an important uh, part of our res resilience, such as, as food security or pharmaceuticals or so on. So, uh, and therefore, we are mindful of uh, the fact of, of the growth that ambitions that we have need to be also fueled with two very important things. One is technology, and uh, we are betting in technology again. We are creating a, 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 an ecosystem, first of all, regulation, but most importantly, enabling the private sector to, in, to invest in the right technologies that allow these, these uh, uh, production facilities produced beyond the global average. And secondly, which I think is the most important bet we have in the country in general, not only in industry and mining, is our human capital uh, wealth. The human capital wealth today in Saudi Arabia is tremendous in terms of their engagement, their ability to engage, especially in new technologies, their ability to grow, their ability to innovate. So if you add to this the RDI ecosystem that we are creating and how it will 
enable us to continue building on, on the human capital. And we talked about execution, we talked about engagement of, 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 of women and so on. And I also say that the engagement of youth today in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. is tremendous. I, mean, yeah. I have four kids, five kids, four girls and one boy. And the way I see <laughs> how they are interested in what the government is doing is just enormous. I mean, when I was their age, I never cared what the government is doing. And today, <laughs> to see these kids really, uh, they understand what we are doing, they question what we are doing. So it's a challenge for me at home, but I think it's great. Well, I'm very happy for your challenge at home. That's a, one, that's a wonderful. Uh, I think it's got to be the ending. I'm looking at my. Uh, it is. Yes. Zero, 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 uh, zero. So, so the, the, the tyranny of the clock, I'm afraid. Um, but let, let me just close by saying uh, two things. First of all, uh, what a great thing to fill up this room. Uh, it's a little harder to get here, but I actually like, uh, I like the Kerr Park. I like this area. Uh, and so just terrific that you all came. It's a full house. Uh, second of all, uh, what an amazing group of speakers with incredible background and knowledge. And then also sitting in the audience in the front row, I see others. I hope um, His Highness Prince Faisal doesn't mind me calling attention to him. Uh, he could do the panel on his own as the foreign <laughs> minister, um, but but uh, the planning minister as well. And so so thanks to each and every one of you. Thanks to the audience, uh, and enjoy the rest of Davos. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Fred. Thank you.